am i visible and audible yeah we yeah. can see you <clears throat> so uh, my talk is on locked posterior dislocation of a shoulder and i work in mumbai in these hospitals so coming to the case uh, <clears throat> he is uh, 30 years old had a fall 4 months back and uh, as expected in interior of india he was treated by quack and the x ray was taken and as usual it was missed so initial misdiagnosis is very common and because in a posterior dislocation the x ray you take looks normal to some of the uh, sub busy surgeons and if you don't focus on it and the points which i will cover in the next slides it is often misdiagnosed as frozen shoulder or usually a post traumatic stiffness so in the history what is important is uh, anterior dislocation and the posterior dislocation the anterior dislocation as uh, has been covered earlier it is more common as compared to the posterior dislocation and this posterior dislocation usually is seen those who have seizure disorders those who have a electric shock and uh, those who fall on a outstretched hand so this patient had a fall on outstretched hand he didn't had seizure or a electric shock and uh, the important clinical examination the points here at 4 months he did not have any pain but he had restriction of movements uh, his shoulder was almost stiff and the arm was locked in a internal rotation of 40 degrees and it was obviously adapted so no further active or passive external rotation was possible from this position and uh, as happens in uh, dislocation usually the subacromial space uh, is empty the normal globular appearing shoulder is not visible and at 4 months there is some deltoid atrophy so these are uh, the clinical examination which you must look for and some of them were present in this case now why does this happen Uh, what is a cause it is a involuntary muscle contraction the strong internal rotators the lats dorsi the pec major the subscapularis and the teres major they simply overpower the weak external rotators that is the infraspinatus and the teres minor so it's a muscular cause basically which is responsible for uh, uh, the uh, dislocation and Uh, what is important for diagnosis is uh, ap view most often we don't get a proper ap view and uh, axillary view again is missed or it is not taken most of the time on the right hand side you see a clear picture where uh, you can see a normal appearing x ray and you can uh, see the glenoid very well the humeral head which is globular and the glenohumeral space in between if you take a normal x ray view as discussed earlier as shown in the pictures then ideally you should get this type of view out here in this our case what you see is the glenoid is vacant that means the globular humeral head probably the shape has changed and it is not articulating with the glenoid cavity so often that can be confirmed once you take a axillary view so what you see here is if you follow my cursor this is the glenoid cavity and this is the anterior part of the humeral head and the posterior part of the humeral head is locked against the posterior rim of the glenoid so this is a radiological diagnosis is of a locked posterior dislocation now why it is often missed because when we we don't take a normal standard view so this is the another patient's x ray who had a posterior dislocation not this present x ray uh, not this present case which we are discussing only to bring out some of the radiological signs which will be important when you see or notice this x ray the picture on the right is of a anterior dislocation where you see a empty glenoid so in a anterior dislocation the humeral head will be under the coracoid process and the glenoid will be entirely empty like you see in a normal x ray and here what you see is you can see the shape of the humeral head which is changed and there are two important signs these are the crescent sign and the pear shape the sh this is not classical pear shape of the humerus but 
the in a dislocated posterior dislocation the humeral head appears to be pear shape then the second important sign is a crescent sign so if you uh, notice here the overlap of the humeral head and the glenoid cavity on the or the glenoid uh, there is a overlap of so much 6 to 7 mm so that is a crescent shape or a crescent sign which is seen in posterior dislocation which is normal view you don't see that overlap apart from that if you follow uh, like the normal head appears to be globular and very clear out here if you follow there is a impaction if you draw a line and follow that there is a impaction of the humeral head whether it is anterior or a posterior we don't know so if you view the ap x ray properly you will be able to make out these signs and very uh, uh, it will be very less often you will be missing these posterior dislocation in the x rays so coming back to our case this was the x ray uh, where you see a vacant glenoid sign so these are three or four signs the pear shaped humerus the crescent sign the vacant glenoid and the trough line so these are the four five signs which you follow you will never miss a posterior dislocation any further investigation is required yes a ct scan is required because that will decide what kind of surgery you will be following both 2d ct and 3d ct is important normally uh, the important structure what you are supposed to see is a bicipital groove on the medial side is your lesser tuberosity on the outer side is the greater tuberosity and uh, the humeral plane like it makes uh, uh, that will be visible when you do a 3d subtraction of the glenoid so this is a normal 2d ct where you see there is nothing much we can make out in a coronal but if you see the axial view it is very important the normal view you follow the bicipital groove as you can see here on the medial side is your lesser tuberosity on the lateral side is a greater tuberosity so in our case if you follow so this is a bicipital groove on the medial side this is the anterior side this is the posterior side on the medial side is a glenoid tuberosity is a lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity is intact and what you see here is a fragment which is posterior part of the humeral head now ideally that is uh, Uh, should be here like this so that the head appears globular so there is some impaction of the anteromedial side of the humeral head and that is the reverse hill sacs lesion in a an anterior dislocation you will see the same hill sacs lesion on the lateral side in a chronic anterior dislocation so here this is called as a reverse hill sac because it is on the opposite side of a normal appearing uh, Uh, hill sacs lesion apart from that on the greater tuberosity what is attached are the rotator cuff the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus and on the medial side is your subscapularis so the bicipital groove has separation of subscapularis on the medial side and the supraspinatus on the lateral side these are two important structures and the landmark when you are doing a dissection for your surgical procedure thus 3d ct in which you subtract the glenoid as the glenoid is intact you subtract the glenoid and then you can have the appearance of the humeral head so what you see here is the anterior part of the uh, glenoid or the anterior part of the humeral head which is separated and even the distance between the shaft and the humeral head has increased suggesting probably there is also a fracture of the neck so since this is a four months you cannot make out apart from that what you have to see is what is the relation of the glenoid now if you can see this view the glenoid and the humeral head most of the humeral head is posterior and some part of the humeral head is articulating so if you see the similar view ideally this is the glenoid so the glenoid should be in the center of the humeral head half of the posterior half would be seen like behind and anterior half of the humeral head will be seen anteriorly in a normal view so here in this case you see most of the humeral head behind and that is exactly 
when you reconstruct you will be seen this is the part of the anterior uh, part of the humeral head which is articulating with the glenoid and the major part probably it is fractured is articulating with the uh, or it is dislocated posteriorly and it is locked so what was done in this since it was 4 months old uh, uh, a surgical procedure wherein we uh, take a approach of a delto we take a delto pectoral approach right from the coronoid process up to the insertion of the deltoid we take a incision we release the lesser tuberosity partially and osteotomize it so that then you can open uh, the joint release the scar tissue between the humeral head and the posterior glenoid rim the humeral head which is locked it is unlocked posteriorly by pushing it and laterally uh, subluxating it and then externally rotating it so normally what is important is there is a average retroversion of about 19 degrees of the humeral head in relation to the medial epicondyle and in this particular case that uh, probably the head was fracture and hence the major part of the head was retroverted i'll come to the clinical pictures so what was done was planning a osteotomy through the fracture site the old fracture site by marking with the k wire so after doing the osteotomy you can see this is the lateral epicondyle the medial epicondyle is on the inner side and you can see how much is the head retroverted so osteotomy was done here to correct the retroversion of the head through the original plane of the fracture line after identifying with the help of a k wire so this is how the osteotomy was performed and once the osteotomy was open then uh, this is the anterior part of the humeral head then the posterior part of the humeral head was relocated over the glenoid and then fixed with temporarily k wires and then this is how it was reconstructed with the help of uh, sutures and a plate and the defect uh, was uh, the hill sacks lesion or the defect on the anteromedial part of the humeral head was uh, covered with the bone graft and the transfer of the subscapularis i'll come to it again so this is the final c arm picture this is how the head was reconstructed and then the lesser tuberosity which is here so it was transferred in the defect so the red mark area is the original site of the lesser tuberosity so it was transferred little bit medially and then fixed with the screw so this screw represents the fixation of that and some graft were used to fill up the defect so this is a maclaughlin transfer of the subscapularis for a defect usually when we have a defect of 20 to 40% this procedure was done this is the 6 months post of healing of this uh, patient and that is his range of movement at about 6 9 months so he can do the complete circumduction that is the external rotation and the internal rotation the patient has at 18 months he doesn't have a avian but this screw which was fixing the lesser tuberosity has little bit migrated and that is what is bothering him so subsequently we would be removing that so to uh, the treatment of a posterior dislocation depends on the size of the defect the duration of the dislocation age and activity of the patient uh, is there any role of conservative treatment yes in elderly patient who have very low demands they can be Uh, they can undergo a supervised neglect those patients who have uncontrolled fits they can be left alone and they can follow the same neglect and those who cannot participate in the rehab program those who are not mentally fit those who cannot take part in the physiotherapy uh, they can also be conserved surgical treatment is basically based on non anatomic and anatomic reconstruction of the reverse hill sacks lesion and or shoulder orthoplasty close reduction uh, when do you call it chronic when it crosses a, a duration of 3 weeks usually these they are unreducible 
So any posterior dislocation which is beyond three weeks is called as a chronic, and uh, that should be considered for a surgical treatment. And second dictum is you should consider close reduction only when the defects, the reverse hill sack defect is less than 25%. And how do you do the close reduction? Under general anesthesia and muscle relaxant, gentle reduction is attempted by flexing and adapting the arm with the axial traction. The direct posterior pressure on the humeral head from behind can facilitate the reduction. Now, in a situation where uh, there is uh, the, the dislocation is locked, you have to unlock it. How do you unlock it? Gentle internal rotation may help to stretch out the posterior capsule and the rotator cuff. What is locked, you have to take it laterally by giving a lateral tra traction. So unless <coughs> that locked part comes in contact with the glenoid cavity, uh, don't externally rotate, otherwise it will fracture. So lateral traction and then external rotation will take care of unlocking and then immobilize the arm by the side in external rotation of 20 degrees for about six weeks. <coughs> Sorry. So the locked posterior dislocation, the hill sacs lesion can be divided and classified by a CT scan and the size of defect, as I said earlier, decides what type of treatment, surgical treatment they will need. If you take an axial scan and divide the humeral head in these two zones, then uh, the one which is articulating with the glenoid, if you have a defect which is less than 25% of the articular surface of the head, that is one case. Second is a medium sized defect, which are between 25 to 50%, like here, which have a CT picture like this, which involve the complete equator or the zone, or the one which you have a large defect of more than 50%. These three categories of posterior dislocation have different management to altogether. So our case was like this. It was somewhere a large defect, which was more than 50%. So what we had done is a rotational osteotomy, part of the humeral head. So in management, defects which are less than 25%, all what they need is a maclaughlin transfer where you release the subscapularis from the lesser tuberosity and fill the defect with the tendon. So that will take care of the small hill sacs lesion and open reduction is all what is required. So defects which are little larger, say 25 to 50%, what you require is a modification of the maclaughlin's, wherein you take the entire lesser tuberosity and transfer it in the defect and fix it with the screw. Or you have a, a, a defect which are about 50%, they require a rotational osteotomy and uh, or you fill up the defect with a hollow or autograph and reconstruct that defect. And lastly, uh, those defects which are more than 50% and in elderly patient, a hemi or total replacement would be the treatment of choice as discussed in by Dr. Kotwal also. So posterior dislocations, these are very rare injuries. They account to about 1% to 5% of the shoulder dislocation. And uh, one, one uh, article which you must read and you must follow before, uh, if you're doing a surgery, this is a very important article by SICAC in 2004 that gives you everything what is required for considering a conservative treatment or a surgical treatment. And if you have to do a surgical treatment, what would be your ideal choice? So uh, this was about a lock posterior dislocation, uh, how to diagnose, what are the radiological signs, which cases to conserve, um, and if you are operating, what are the different procedure and what we have done in our case and the follow-up of that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.